Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to our debate at GV Art, London's uh, premier uh, venue for art science interactions within a co commercial gallery setting. This evening, we're going to be debating a future for science and art interactions, or art and science interactions, however you care to place them. We will be streaming this event live, and you're now joining us doing that, um, and also tw uh, inviting Twitter uh, conversations and questions throughout the debate. The hashtag is art and science, um, and uh, at GV underscore art. And uh, before I go on to introduce our distinguished panel this evening, I'd like to please introduce myself. My name's Dr. Marius Quint. I'm Senior Lecturer in Visual Culture at the University of Portsmouth. Um, I taught art history at the University of Oxford for uh, approximately 10 years. Uh, and uh, prior to that, spent a bit of time at the uh, Victoria and Albert Museum, the Royal College of Art, and uh, various other institutions. I have a background in writing the history of the circus, but uh, I became interested in art and science uh, partly um, through the influence of colleagues um, at uh, Oxford. And uh, more recently, I was a guest curator uh, with Lucy Shanahan of the Welcome Collection Brains, The Mind as Matter, uh, which is touring to Manchester later this year. Um, on my right, uh, to the viewer's left, is Dr. Kat Austin. Uh, Kat writes that uh, she is a person, which I'm very glad to see, um, and perhaps engaging with the sort of uh, occasional absurdity of self-autobiography. Uh, she's interested in lots of things and phenomena, I'm very glad to hear, how things are connected and why they are connected. She likes patterns, but doesn't have to have them. She writes on art, science, art, culture, science, and the history of science, and edits new science scientist culture lab section and she's also a practicing artist and researcher cat was previously an environmental chemist at the university of cambridge cat is passionate about justice and respect and the cool digital technologies that help to promote these so welcome cat um, to my immediate right is uh, Oren Katz, who is uh, an artist, who's just flown in uh, to uh, the UK to th this evening, is an artist, researcher and curator who undertook pioneering work with the Tissue Culture and Art Project, which he established in 1996. He is the founding director of Symbiotica since 2000 and uh, leading artistic research centre at the um, University of Western Australia and a winner of the pre Ars Electronica. Electronica, Golden Nika in hybrid art. Oren's work reaches beyond the confines of art, often being cited as an inspiration in areas as diverse as new materials, textiles, de textile design, um, architecture, ethics, fiction and food. And recently, um, Oren has been setting up a biological art lab um, at Alto University in Helsinki, named after the famous Finnish architect, um, and where he is visiting professor. And he was also recently a visiting professor at the Royal College of Art here in London. To my left, uh, Robert Dev Devcic is our host this evening. He's the founder and director of GV Art Gallery. And GV Art, I should uh, emphasize, after having introduced it, is the UK's leading and only contemporary art gallery dedicated to promoting art and science interactions, and in particular, interdisciplinary dialogues, such as we're hopefully going to enjoy this evening, that encourage new creative processes. He's also an agent for a number of artists and has curated exhibitions at GV Art and other venues, since uh, 2005, which he continues to do with great vigour and panache. Um, on uh, the, uh, my far left here is Arthur I. Miller, Professor Arthur I. Miller, who is Emeritus Professor of History and Philosophy of Science at University College London, uh, previously taught physics at Harvard University. Um, he is fascinated by the nature of creative thinking and, in particular, creativity in art and science. Um, his books include 137, Jung, Pauli, and the Pursuit of Scientific Obsession, and uh, Einstein, Picasso, which was nominated for a Pulitzer Prize. His forthcoming book is The New Avant-Garde, Dispatches from the Edge of Art and Science, based on over 160 interviews, which he's been uh, conducting over the uh, last year or two. Um, he's also a curator. He curated the show Art and Science, merging art and science to make a new uh, revolutionary new art movement here at GV Art Gallery. 
uh, and uh, in between is uh, Anaïs Tondeur and uh, Anaïs is a, an artist her practice draws on an exploration of the interface between science and art uh, perception and cognition fact and fiction through drawing early techniques of photography installation and new media art her work stems from a fascination by the history of ideas uh, she's particularly interested in ideas of civilization and how those relate to views of the universe and of the biosphere and um, of the uh, of the uh, geo geological environment as well. Uh, Anais uh, gained her master's in mixed media at the Royal College of Art in 2010, and uh, two years later, in 2012, she was awarded the Arcadi Bursary Awards for Digital Arts. So, ladies and gentlemen, would you please um, welcome your panel? Thank you. So what we're going to do, uh, first of all, the format is that uh, we start off with a brief um, position statement in which uh, our various panellists will say what they think uh, the future of art and science interactions uh, should hold. That will be approximately two minutes in length um, and will hopefully generate some ideas for teasing out later through discussion, which will also involve you, the audience, um, and our online audience as well. Uh, just to give you a, a little bit of uh, uh, gloss and background, um, there was a, a couple of evenings uh, ago here uh, an interesting symposium, the Art and Mind Symposium, at which uh, Dr. Daniel Glazer of the Wellcome Trust uh, was talking about the instrumentalization um, and whether this should happen or not of art uh, within the context of science. Uh, so there was a, a lively philosophical uh, debate around that. Uh, and it's certainly true that art and science interactions are a growth area but the question is how do we make it sustainable how do we build a future for it do we want to make it sustainable should we just let it grow as a bubble and then pop but if we are to make it sustainable then how can it be done intellectually economically socially and ethically so I would hope that the tendency of tonight's discussion will be uh, less uh, perhaps purely philosophical and directed perhaps to practicalities and policies, though these, of course, depend on principles and philosophies themselves. So we're thinking about the future. We're thinking, to some extent, how uh, people can, as it were, earn a living from uh, art and science interactions and how it can not only make an aesthetic contribution, which I think everyone here would largely agree that it does, um, but uh, also if you like, it can pay its way. So I would like to start with Kat and introduce each of our uh, panellists in turn to speak their position in two minutes. Thank you, Marius. Um, thank you for having me. Um, so in terms of uh, placing myself and my position, I wanted to explain where I came from and how my thoughts on the matter emerged to give you a context of how I position art and science because to me the future of art and science is part of a much larger thing. So I always wanted to be a scientist when I was growing up. Um, I was very, I had a very utilitarian and socially minded kind of philosophy and approach to things and so I went uh, into environmental computational chemistry eventually. Um, my, when I progressed past my PhD I entered an e-science project and e-science projects uh, happened at the same time as Web 2.0 exploded in the mid 2000s and it became very clear through the project that it was important to have interactions between people from different disciplines within science. It was, we were all approaching scientific problems, the same problems, but at different scales. And if we could only talk to each other better, beyond the kind of conferences and so on, um, the uh, traditional means of communication, then you know we could really kind of catalyse and expedite, expedite the... In, the discoveries and sort of in, in my case for environmental science the kind of progress that we wanted to achieve so I, be I became involved and I co-founded a, a social networking site for scientists which was designed to facilitate this kind of um, discourse 
So at the same time, I was becoming interested in art and design and journalism and communication. Um, I became a full-time sculptor after finishing um, my postdoc at Cambridge. And for me, it was a, another means by which I could convey what I'd learnt and what I was learning about the environment and our interactions with it. When I started to work at New Scientist, I was working with communities um, and writing about art and science collaborations as well as traditional kind of scientific journalism. And there again, this thread of a kind of digitally enabled community um, shone through as, as something really important. And uh, this democratisation of knowledge that we're experiencing now um, is fundamental, I think. The importance of, kind of actively engaging a community and actively communicating between groups and between individuals, not just two, but between, so that there's a feedback. It's a cultural shift. It's, it's something that is affecting us in every way. And this shift towards a society of engaged, active individuals who collaborate collectively to achieve shared goals and emerging goals is, is the context in which I see art and science. This, these disciplines, they don't have to invade on each other's territories they can coexist along with other disciplines, both in a community but in an individual also. And for me, at least, and I understand it's not the case for everybody, but for me, art and science and my journalistic communications are all ways in which I can synthesise what I understand to be my existence in the world and then convey it to people. And briefly, what do you think then the future holds? I think we're going to follow on this trajectory of a democratised uh, co community talking to each other. I think this, the only thing that stands in the way are rigid structures that we've built for ourselves, you know. But even, even institutions now are assimilating mm. art and science um, and I think that this kind of fluidity and kind of bottom-up approaches that we see in hack spaces and hackathons and so on, it's only going to grow because people have realised that they've got a voice and are engaging intellectually with so many diverse okay. yep. information. So, so um, technology, um, communication technology-driven democratisation... It's changing the worldview. Yeah. And that worldview incorporates... Art and science okay. coming together. Okay, thank you. All right, Oren, um, yes. please uh, tell us your your position and your vision of the future. Okay, so I think we are not going to have time to unpack the whole thing, but I think it's important to remember that when we talk about science, it's a bit of an obscure uh, term, and most of what we see is art and science collaboration are not like that at all. Mm -hmm. uh, the science we're referring to is usually more in the realm of uh, technology and engineering. And that brings me neatly to, to my interest, because my interest is not science. As an artist, I'm interested in what's going on with life. Mm -hmm. And it so happens that the most radical uh, shifts in the way we deal with life are happening within the laboratories of the engineers and the scientists, and in a different way as well. So we have now life that becomes a raw material for us to manipulate, and as an artist, I want to be involved with it as a way of engaging with it, uh, both critically but also to explore the possibilities of that. And that's why I parked myself in the science department back in 1996, and I never left uh, working in a lab. The future is actually quite interesting because the experience in Finland is teaching me something very, very important, that artists can set up fully functioning labs where you can engage with the manipulation of life outside of the scientific establishment. So we established a, a fully functioning lab uh, that can uh, facilitate uh, molecular biology, uh, tissue engineering, <coughs> microbiology, run by an art department with a full-time lab technician that drives it uh, within a building of uh, electrical engineers from all places. So in a sense, it is, it's becoming quite fluid, but I don't really like to talk about it in terms of art and science, because 
of the fact that you know you can't talk about photography as art and science anymore. You can't talk about mixing paints as chemistry anymore. You know, it's not about that. It's about the fact that we have new tools to manipulate matter, and in the case of my interest, it's living matter, and we need to engage with it in a way which is beyond just the very uh, uh, kind of strict confines of what we call science and what we call art. So would you um, permit me a, a brief question? Yep. Um, would you see then there's a continuing aspect of, if you like, modernism's dialogue with technology? Um, yeah, but it goes even way further back than that. It's humans' fascination with life and, and humans' fascination with manipulating everything around us. And it so happened that life is becoming the most extreme form of manipulation that we are engaged with at the moment, and it needs much more cultural articulation. One of the things I'm claiming is that we don't have a cultural language mm-hmm. to engage with what we're doing to life, and therefore we need more artists and more other people to, to do it. And what you are talking about is democratization shows that those tools of manipulation are getting out of the hands of the people that we thought are the authority mm. and are now moving towards other hands, which I think is important. Mm. Thank you very much. Robert. Thank you, Maris. Um, I just want to talk a bit more about the kind of the sustaining part of it. Um, I just think that art and science, I mean, we can talk about terminology later on, but just for the sake of this evening to start with, I think that art and science interactions can be many different things. Um, but meaningful collaborations um, between art and science um, involve trust and long-term dialogues. It's not just something that you sort of kind of jump in and out of. Um, and it is about enabling a creative journey that's based on process without having prescribed outcomes, whether that's being prescribed by the funder or the, you know, whoever or, and so on. But anyway, more about that later. Um, wh- wh- when the starting point of an art-science collaboration is a tick-box exercise or a PR a campaign that only measures outcomes by footfall as a success or you know the number of interactions etc then that that becomes less meaningful and and it's unlikely that that, that, that the art that's produced from those interactions will, will be remembered not only in art but even in science history I mean to develop meaningful interactions um, I would say as an artist's agent and also as a curator that we need to to discuss a number of things, and I've just got six quick bullet points I'll I'll rush through and we can come back to it later. Um, I think that artists and scientists need to stop um, uh, using each other and exploiting one another. Um, I think that we need to support equal partnerships that lead to trust and dialogues, as I said earlier, and promoting understanding of collaborations with details such as like moral rights and intellectual property rights and so on. I think within the art world... Uh, when artists work within the art world, all those things are fairly clear, but when artists start working in the science world, then there isn't as much of that experience that goes on, so all sorts of things can uh, go wrong and um, become barriers and so on. Um, sustaining practice, um, particularly for artists, um, and that's kind of like you know getting funding for true production costs, exhibition costs and so on. I think that often... Um, Art science collaborations are kind of part funded and they're, not, they're almost set up to fail before they've even started um, for financial and other reasons. And then, you know, how we go about stimulating creative processes that enable artists and science to influence each other's creativity. Um, I think that's an area that I think a lot of scientists in particular find a little bit more difficult. Um, and then that sort of, you know, equality thing has to come back in. And then acknowledging when things um, don't work um, and, and be able to say as well. Yes, you know, this has worked. These collaborations are, you know, have influenced the way that I work and operate on a daily basis. And I, and I think that I hear that positive more from um, artists than I do from scientists. But I do know a lot of scientists who have now come around to actually be, you know, man enough or whatever to be able to step up and say, actually, yes, it has made an impact, it has made an influence. Anyway, so these are just some of my suggestions. And I think that, you know, I want to get the conversation started, starting a bit more that, you know, this interactions... Um, that some of these um, interactions, we need to consider some of these points before the interactions begin. And um, I think that um, we also need to have those conversations with um, um, art and science institutions, you know, whether they're funders or commissioners or whoever, and, and sort of have those conversations and start developing an understanding that allows a meaningful sharing of creativity and knowledge to create and discover the unexpected. Thank you very much. You. Uh, it's a very well thought out and prepared statement and one that bases very much on this idea of respect and trust and status and, and those sort of things which are often occluded or hidden mm. from uh, the relationships because obviously there are varying in different contexts statuses for art and science and, and artists and scientists and people that 
uh, pursue them as well as um, incomes and so on. So thank you. Um, Anais, so you're uh, an early career artist, I guess, and um, so you must have uh, a vision of the future as well, or hopes and, and plans for the future, and uh, as well as a position in, in relation to that. Well, I may start now with the vision that I have at the moment and what I'm experiencing and really starting with this fascination that I have for, um, in fact, attempts of our civilization to kind of make sense and understand what it is to be human and how to relate uh, with the world around us. So in my practice, I'm looking at all um, an embodied or narrative or aesthetic experience can influence this encounter with an object of knowledge and in fact um, also explore how the art can yeah, interpret <coughs> encounter this knowledge but also explore what this knowledge is about. Um, so this has led me to collaborate with um, several scientists in the field of the geosciences and physics and astrophysics and what I would like to point like, and stress from now is that in fact, the idea is that the art is never used for, yeah, to illustrate or to be used more as a kind of like prolongation of what the science is or as a communication tool. Uh, and it's more about looking at through an aesthetic and artistic scope or to challenge and observe humans shifting and constantly evolving understanding of what is around us. Okay, thank so, you. Very much. Oh, sorry, you finished. No, carry on. <laughs> Please carry on. So, more to uh, think about uh, uh, yeah, the future and how we can continue to interact from mm -hmm. each field because I think it's interesting to set this dialogue and creation where, in fact, it's learning about each other but from our own practice. And so, kind of like keep open and this, keep this creative mind open about this kind of interplay between a, a conceptual understanding mm -hmm. and an intuitive imagination. That's very, um, very well, but surely art is also about <coughs> sheer aesthetics and the, you know, I mean, you create beautiful images, don't mm -hmm. you, if I may say so. And, and so... Um, what about a position that might say, well, hang knowledge, you know, this is about enjoyment. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, how do you respond to that very briefly? Um, can you just... I'll think about it. Okay, mm -hmm. well, put it, put, it, put it to one side for a minute, but, you know, is knowledge important in art? Should mm -hmm. it be about aesthetics more? So that, that's well, the, the I mean, question. I think it's also uh, looking at all the aesthetic experience <coughs> can lead to this object of knowledge. Mm -hmm. Okay, super, thank you. And Arthur, uh, looking at it from this uh, a career of experience in, in, in science and teaching science and working in science <coughs> and the history of science and writing and all these interviews, what, what is your uh, vision of the future, as it were, or where it should go? <laughs> <Maybe> my, <coughs> my position first, um, art sci, and I've looked around for a better term, but I, couldn't find, I can't find any right now, is a bold new art movement of the 21st century and it produces works that involve art, science, and technology. It's the new avant-garde. But it's more than that, and that it can offer a different perspective on the world around us and our universe as well. And in this way, its contribution to culture will transcend pre-21st century art. And this is to be expected in such an interdisciplinary subject. As time goes on, collaborations will be more successful, between artists and scientists. That is to say, the hour will go both ways. Right now, it's the artist that gets more out of it than the scientist. And the work produced is starting to be less and less decorative and, uh, and involving more serious considerations of probing science. Art Sci has found, we talked about sustainability, mm -hmm. and that question has uh, arisen, and usefulness, and so on mm -hmm. and so forth. Um, Art Sci has found its own market niches in many venues worldwide, including the many biennials that have come online, which include Documenta, there's uh, The Welcome, GV, uh, Oz Electronica, Science Gallery, um, and there are also many faculty positions open, uh, many in the U.S., probably more than here, but here they're appearing also, and that art science is beginning to appear in the curriculum of art, of art schools, such as Central St. Martin and UCL as well, in the uh, Slade schools. Private sales are open. In other words, uh, 
art side is sustainable, it's, it's here to stay. As for the future, uh, and also, through these, through these niches, art side is able to avoid the art world, the capital A and capital W, which is right now hostile to this form of art. As for the future, art side reflects the disciplines characteristic of the 21st century, and this is especially true in media art. I believe that in the future, a third culture will emerge in which art, science, and technology will completely merge, and denizens of this culture will sit in front of computers with as yet dreamt of uh, architectures and will use them to formulate a new science which will generate images that will be aesthetic and beautiful in the new meaning of these terms. Um, among my responses to skeptics is uh, about a third culture is who would have dreamt 30 years ago that art, science, and technology would look as they do now? And all this will depend upon on the on curriculum changes and unification of knowledge. Clearly, there's just too much to learn right now for any one person in both art and the sciences. But everything is unified, and there will be fewer and fewer um, uh, disciplines out there and facts that will become more and more irrelevant and a truly big picture will emerge. Thank you very much. And that was a very clear statement, both of position and, and, and future intentions uh, or, or, or future patterns. So, you know, we have different positions here um, we, and we have different experiences. What we're trying to um, begin to draw out then are uh, perhaps strategies, uh, ways of promoting, developing uh, this broad field of interests that we have um, in interdisciplinary uh, work. I think this would be a good moment uh, to introduce uh, one or two questions from the floor, and uh, we'd certainly invite you to do that, as well as perhaps to um, uh, get Robert to tell us some of the, uh, the Twitter feed uh, as well, as uh, once we, we get going. So are there any questions uh, from uh, our audience, please? Ruth. Um, I was interested when you said that there's a lot of scepticism in the, in the art world. And I was wondering whether it was actually because of the banner of art science, whether that is in itself a kind of um, hindrance. Because, I, could, I mean, one could probably think at the drop of a hat of dozens of extremely sort of successful commercial artists and exhibitions that wouldn't be called art science because they, aren't, they haven't been made from an official collaboration, but the, 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 the outcome is in itself affected by or somehow connected to, um, to to something scientific. I mean, you only have to look at the, the light show at the Hayward Gallery or right. any number of... Um... Yeah. I, I wouldn't consider that as art science. I would consider that as just decoration. Uh, but in the many interviews I've done, there is this problem with, with naming. And uh, art science, it's a real problem. I don't like that name, but I don't care to think of anything else. Uh, people in, uh, you know, there's, there's electronic art, digital art, robotic art, and it goes on and on and on. And uh, many people will say, gee, that's just cool. I wish I could figure out a name like that. Maybe I'd be famous. Uh, they prefer media art. That covers everything. And in my book, that would cut me down to about three chapters, so I, I have to uh, <laughs> use these other, these other names. But there is, there is a naming problem, and there is collaboration amongst artists and scientists, um, forms of collaboration. But uh, this third culture I spoke about, um, a lot of people are, some people are skeptical of it, even sitting here. And uh, you, when I talk to people in media art at the MIT Media Lab and the NYU Media Lab, they say, what's the big deal? It's here already. We, we do it. And they, they, they do. I mean, there's a, one person I spoke to who won an Academy Award for work on uh, animation. And this work on animation requires some very complex mathematical work to generate figures which people like to see. They are aesthetic. They are, they are beautiful. Okay, well, uh, since there was a, a suggestion that there might be some disagreement about this idea of the third culture or, um, and, and also how that might or not grow or whether it's done, uh, I'll, I'll put the same question now to this side, a response perhaps um, to Oren. Your, your question? Yes, yes. Okay. yes. Yeah, no, I think it's, it's a great question and I think one of the problems is this 
problem framing. And the, the other fact is, and we had a debate here a few months ago where a Stella was a couple of years, ago, years ago. <laughs> <laughs> um, where Stella was talking about the fact that curators mm -hmm. that are dealing kind of in the, the stump chart world, they, they can deal with artists that can talk back to them. So that's one reason I would say that the artists who are falling within this uh, realm seem to be able to talk back, and curators don't like artists who know more than the, what they know. Um, and so that is put aside is also, I think the problem is the problem of framing, and I think the main problem is the discussion about it also in terms of collaboration. My experience running, I suppose, the longest established uh, uh, art and biology research center in the world is that it's not real collaboration. I'm, I'm actually exploiting scientists, and I pay them for that, and I get them to mentor the artist, but it's really about the artist doing their work. It's not about art and science collaboration in this realm. It's about artists gaining enough knowledge for them to be able to engage with the new materials that are being offered to them uh, through those, this new knowledge. Uh, and if we frame it like that, maybe things would be better. And I think the reason why we survived for so long is because we never really fell down the path of this uh, rhetoric of the third culture or anything else that promises so much and delivers so little. Yeah. Okay, well, that's a very clear um, and practical uh, experience. And uh, yes, no, Kat, Kat uh, did warn me with our, our previous phone call that she was suffering. So, um, and meanwhile, Robert, I mean, do you have a, does framing and do, does terminology become a problem uh, in your work? I mean, how, you know. I, yeah, yes, it is a problem, but I think it's one that we're always going to have. Um, I mean, I have had art world people for the last two years say things along the lines of why are you polluting art with science and various other things, but... The same people who said that two years ago now saying, "Oh, I think you're onto something. I think it's really great. I really, you know, I think it's great that you know there's a depth of knowledge and narrative and this, that, and the other and whatever, which is you know meaningful and all of that." So they're less intimidated by it. But I think originally there were a lot of people who just, particularly in the art world, were just a bit kind of thinking, "Well, I don't know anything about science. I'm not really comfortable with this." But you don't really need to know about science, um, and you can just see it as a beautiful aesthetic object, etc. And if you don't want to know anything more about it, that's fine. So. Yes, language is a problem, and I think it's one of those things that we hopefully tonight can kind of elaborate a bit more on. I don't have the perfect answer, and depending on who I'm speaking to, um, everyone uses different um, ways of phrasing it. I wish I could think of a solution. I can't. I try the word polymath. I've tried all sorts of other, you know, kind of ways of work, navigating around historical things. I mean, personally, I hate the, the terminology sci art because it has a history, it has a baggage, it has whatever. Um, I don't think art and science is perfect either, but. You know, I think at the end of the day, we're all going to end up living in a very interdisciplinary world. We're all going to be interdisciplinary. Um, it's just the way things are. And I think what Kat was saying about putting lots of different people in a, in a room and have all different kind of skills and coming together to solve things, make things, produce things, whatever, I think that's the way everything's moving, thankfully. Um, but what we call that, I mean, I'm not, I, you know, I don't know. And I think it's really difficult sometimes when um, you start putting labels on things because you kind of... you. You sort of break away, and but it's at some point we do have to acknowledge that there is a movement, there is something happening. But what do you call it? You know, I mean, we can talk about bio art, and a lot of people will say, Well, actually, that's terminology I don't like or understand or want to, to be labeled with. So, you know, I, it's, it's much more than design, it's much more than it's, it's, it's creativity, but what do we call it? Yeah. Okay, well, I think we should have a, another, and this is not to <coughs> exclude um, I, Anais or Kat, but uh, we need to keep the uh, topics rolling. Um, so, again, I would invite uh, questions or yes, contributions sorry. on the... Um, make a coffee if, if I get some hot water. Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah of course. Um, so, with the benefit of experience and practicality, <laughs> and, and, and emphasis on practicalities and policy, I think would be uh, useful. So, uh, Helen... Yeah, look, I'm, I'm really glad that the whole question of collaboration has come up. It came up on Tuesday night as well, because I think genuine collaboration between artists and scientists is so rare. I think that what we call collaboration is often one person going to another to seek help to realise a project that they generated, um, whether it's scientists needing artists for their communication needs or artists needing the skills of scientists to animate their their project. It's very, very rare that both parties are actually contributing conceptually to the project. And I think that's the, the problem with the notion of collaboration. It's not actually collaboration. It's, it's certainly using um, scientists as consultants or 
their expert help for certain aspects of the project. But how often has anybody seen a, a project where there's been a sort of conceptual contribution from both parties? And I think the, the problem comes back to the fact that epistemologically and on other levels, the practices are so diverse that it's very difficult to transcend that, even with a sort of appreciation of the aesthetic um, qualities of the project that scientists can certainly bring. I think it's it's a misnomer, and it's, that's one of the things. I think there are there are some practice. good examples, and I can think of so some scientists who well, there's not a lot, but there's some scientists who who now have actually called themselves, uh, you know, artist poet, and then later <coughs> scientists, even though they're a trained scientist, and they've not retrained it, you know, as a poet or as an artist, but they've enjoyed collaborating with artists so much. And they will turn around. I mean, Simon Parr, for example, will turn around and say, yes, I did get a lot from collaborating with Ambrody and other artists, etc. It has changed the way I think and my day-to-day, you know, the way I work as a scientist. There isn't a lot that will say that. But I think for a lot of them, I, I see evidence where it has, but they're just not actually very confident enough to say, actually, put their hand up and say, and admit it. But there, but there is evidence of, of quite a lot. And if you look at Morton Kringleback and a number of other scientists, why do they keep over the last 10 or more years, why do they keep spending the time to work with the same artists over and over on different projects? They must be getting something from it. It can't just be a vanity thing. Yeah, but getting something from it's not the same as saying that the, the project is structured in collaboration. <laughs> It's, it's a, well, it depends on what the, yeah. the I think we're not just talking about getting something from it. <coughs> um, I think it was Helen, I, I heard your name mentioned at the front. Um, I think she's right. The, this genuine collaboration, where in a project the artist and scientists are, are um, giving equally. To, the, to a project. In other words, they are being equally creative to produce something which couldn't otherwise have been produced is actually very rare. And I know in... Um, I know not everybody knows, but I instigated the Welcome Sire project. And I did look at many, many of the projects that had um, been created. Uh, it was a hugely successful program. But I can really guarantee that only 2% uh, of those projects were projects where the two minds genuinely came together to create something which otherwise could not have been created. It's a very difficult and rare thing to do. It's hugely worth it if you can do it. Um, But... um, I have to admit I'm rather heartened by Arthur's comment because I think the way that that percentage will increase will be, will be because of the educational aspect and faculties coming together and, and the merging of education and it will begin to happen more. But um, retrospectively, it's actually quite a tiny proportion where you can say there's genuine success. Those successes are amazing. Thank you. Next question from uh, Brett Wilson, I believe. Yes, thank you. Uh, Carrying on with that uh, point, I think it it, it really is a vital point because looking back over the last 10 years, I think it's probably true to say that most of the projects where artists and scientists have collaborated and produced um, uh, an output where they feel they have both made a strong contribution um, have then stopped there. What we need to be looking for in the future, I think, is where the artists and the scientists start to change, start to modulate, start to exchange their conceptual positions as well, where they're learning from each other. And I think this will be helped because in the educational establishment, the uh, traditional disciplinary silos, as it were, are gradually being broken down and the permeable boundaries between uh, disciplines are opening up. And uh, there is much more of a questioning attitude to what actually lies underneath, beneath um, art and science and uh, humanities. Um, And we can see it really as co-aligned sort of communities of practice rather uh, than isolated uh, territories that happen to be separated by uh, a sort of a tectonic dislocation 
as it were. So I think we really need to start looking for the sort of projects where scientists and artists are working together, but are starting to exchange um, their attitudes to the, uh, the world. Thank you. And um, just as a note, uh, do please gesticulate clearly if you'd like to ask a question or uh, interject, because uh, it's a little bit hard to see, actually, from uh, this l uh, high lighting position. Um, I've, I've noted that one. I just want to ask um, Oren if you'd like to respond to some of the points there, because I presume you disagree with aspects. To some extent, although it's interesting, you know, in the... Uh risk of uh, debunking everything I said up to now, it's, it's actually quite interesting that at the moment, actually just uh, this week, we got a new resident at Symbiotica who's a scientist, a neuroscientist, who got funding from a neuroethics funding body to come and engage with the ethics of neuroscience through engagement in our lab. So it's neither art nor science in this context, but it is a place where this scientist can engage with those questions in a way that he couldn't be doing in any other place. Because obviously we have a keen interest in kind of questioning the whole premise of neuroscience uh, to our artistic engagement, and from his perspective, it would be a good place for him to, to at least open up a, a new ways of looking at his own practice as a neuroscientist uh, in this field. So, so there are obviously some benefits <laughs> to this type of collaboration. Scientists might gain some uh, some insights uh, through that. I still believe that, uh, and I agree that my experience at Symbiotica is also that only maybe two percent of all, all of the works that came out of Symbiotica are genuinely. Uh, it can be considered to be genuine art and science collaborations. Yeah, they're not necessarily the best works that came out of Symbiotica, I must say, uh, because in many cases, if you get artists and scientists uh, contributing in an equal way, you get really bad science and really bad art. <laughs> <laughs> so you have to be aware of that. <laughs> <laughs> Arthur, okay, and then we'll bring well, in. I will say it again. I've never, uh, I've, never seen, I've, I've seen scientists produce bad art, but I've never seen an artist produce bad science. <laughs> bad science at all. I mean, I found in, in, in writing my book, and I interviewed over 170 people, um, collaboration turned out to be a minefield. Um, people were very discreet, indiscreet, and, and, and so on. I found that cases where it did work out was only in biology. In physics, it, it didn't. Um, one of the questions I asked scientists to work with, artists, was uh, first, uh, did, was your work affected by it? Uh, uh, what did you get out of it? And then they wrote me, it was like they were writing, reading from the same crib sheet. It helped me be a better speaker, it, helped, it opened up my horizons, blah, blah, blah. And, uh, but then I asked the question, which I should have asked, did it affect your everyday work? Silence. And then finally, some responded. Uh, in physics, they said no. Um, it didn't. In biology, some said yes, and with some people who uh, uh, Robert mentioned. And in, the, um, in, in, in media art, let's say in digital art, data visualization, it, they're one and the same. So they, they don't collaborate. They are the artist and the scientist. Okay. Uh, question from the back, please. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, I was thinking... In hindsight, we think we will look at this as a, as a reformation of kinds in that um, there are huge demographic gaps and the, the languages are very specific between the arts and science, but there's also the ethical and therefore religious aspects. So as religion is being questioned by the more intellectual, supposedly intellectual aspects of society, the swathes of the world that are, are, are sort of falling away from that... Um, so again, so I think the language is critical, the terminology is critical, and looking for a kind of mutual understanding to progress that forward. But also the fact that technology is moving so fast and so basic, and quite often when I'm looking at art projects um, that are using things like Blackberry Pies, for example, you think in another five years something so much more sophisticated will have evolved across the panel. So possibly the aesthetic we apply and the judgments we apply to the artwork now will be very different from the outcomes in another 10 years. OK, I'm going to perhaps put that to Anais <coughs> to respond on that. <laughs> OK. <laughs> How about you, Kat? <laughs> you... Well, I think it, it's true it's a constantly evolving thing. I don't think that that devalues what's happening now. Mm -hmm. um, I think much as our sense of aesthetic has changed you know, since since mm. we started painting caves. Mm. Um, the the aesthetics that will be generated through 
collaborations mm-hmm. between artists and scientists mm-hmm. or you know art science works as they are mm-hmm. labeled now will evolve in the same manner um, but are we you know it, the assembled here are we a broadly secular self perpetuating elite you know is is this oh, leaving this is, this as it were the, the you know <laughs> most of the world behind uh, um, i think was the one of the points of the question there anyone wish to take that well or anyone uh, in the audience like to respond to that specific point um, is that yeah is, is yours a separate point or a Mine. Yes. It's related to oh, okay then. Well, you've had your hand up, and then I'll I'll come to you. Yes. Okay. Well, it just seems to me that many of the responses to, to to the last few issues that have been raised are suggesting that what we really need to be moving towards is is what one of my colleagues um, would call a post disciplinary society or a post disciplinary world. And one of the problems we have with getting hung up about what things are <coughs> labelled or what name we give them is that we're still operating as if we're within our existing disciplinary silos or sections or whatever. So we're trying to find words like sci art or art science, which actually aren't a reflection of where we're moving to in the future, which is a post disciplinary, <coughs> anti disciplinary environment, intellectually and creatively. Where in fact, certainly in my experience, most of my students are already moving that way. <laughs> what, what the biggest barrier to, to, to an art piece or sci art or, or whatever we end up calling it move forward is the likes of some people of my generation still hanging around in these disciplinary silos. But however much we may be encouraging new developments, those with the powers that be and the, the, the power to, to um, allow new movements to develop, particularly with institutional um, organisations, are the people with the say and people with the money haven't yet moved on. But our students are ready to so take those what, places. What so I think study? the future in five to ten years' time is that our students already know what a post-disciplinary society is going to be like and they're going to be the ones who will take up that mantle and make the new work and make the new imaginary creative work through more genuine art science collaborations than we probably have. But, but what do your students study? I mean, because presumably they're their own, as it were, official discipline makes a difference there? Uh, no, they come from a variety of disciplines and many of them would now call themselves interdisciplinary practitioners. But you're working in an art context or...? In an arts and science context. Okay, interesting. Thank you. And um, I think there was another point there which I suggested... Would... Um, I was just prompted by... I think it was your mention of the self-perpetuating, self-perpetuating elite. And um, Kat's earlier mention of the kind of excitement about the dem- democratic means by which we can disseminate and share knowledge. I think we shouldn't exaggerate that dem- democratisation. And also I think a post-disciplinary situation is perfectly possible and perhaps positive, but I don't think you can get to post-disciplinary before you, before you form disciplinary knowledge or some kind of specific. And I think there's a massive risk as well with the kind of um, screen culture and everything of like um, sort of losing attention span, losing capacity for learning and you know not everyone has access to these and at the same time as we're talking about the market potential for these things you need like a public sphere for these things and education needs to come first before this kind of sudden sharing because it's not possible without people first having the potential to learn. Okay, any, any questions proceeding or comments proceeding, proceeding from that? And then I think I would like to invite a Twitter uh, feed as well, because otherwise they'll get fed up um, out there. So, yes, um, the, if that it develops their point, yes. Well, uh, the point I was um, going to start on was that um, I'm a scientist, but at A level I had to drop art in order mm. to pursue my, scientists, mm. my sciences. And that was really <laughs> gutting. And I spent seven years in academia doing um, primary science research and I've left now and I think that's partly because actually you know maybe my artistic drive hasn't been fulfilled and I don't I you know now I'm I'm founding a project that is really meeting art science and technology and it's great and it's and it's really fulfilling and 
I'm, I'm really inspired to hear that people are already working in an interdisciplinary way and the idea of bringing um, disciplines together, you know, so that other people are able to study art and science, you know, at GCSE, A-level, you know, university, then, you know, I think that would be really, really great. Um, so, you know, I feel like this, like putting things into boxes is, is quite detrimental to our thinking. <coughs> Having said that, in when I was in academia and, and I was working in a research institute, there was a lot of, um, uh, what's the right term, kind of, it was, it was seen as a kind of nice to have, a bit fluffy. It was like the tool that you brought in so that you could communicate it. You know, it was there because, you know, we wanted to reach wider audiences. And I think that really discredits the power of art science collaborations. And I've seen incredible exhibitions where quite, um, where campaign issues or where there's a lot of, like, a polarised thinking around issues where art and science have met and actually it's a safe space that maybe can shift people's thinking and the, the thing that's prompted in my mind is there was a nanotechnology exhibition which I think really illustrated some of the paradoxical thinking in the nano world and I, th I think collaborations like this are really amazing for bringing together, you know, activists, policy makers, scientists, you know, people trying to make decisions about where we go in the future and how we progress society. Mm. Okay, thank you. And a, a point there. And then I will come back to you. Yes. Hi, um, yeah, I think that uh, I'm a little sceptical, perhaps, of the collaborative notion. And I think there is an issue with status that has... a. Uh, continued and perpetuated um, and the way I sort of felt I could work around it was by using research uh, because research uh, in academia but uh, as an artistic researcher but I've always been based within the medical sciences so I was doing research that used um, artistic tools but within medical sciences and that seemed to be a way of doing it where it sort of overcame this problem of having titles and labels and became about research that the output happened to be visual as well as text driven you know journals it was the whole thing by uh, working within the Royal College of Surgeons of England to do PhD working in the medical faculty at Copenhagen for postdoc and that seemed to be a really good way of overcoming all of the labels and all of the hierarchical sort of stuff that comes with, well, are you one of the sciences or are you one of the arts? Where it's, well, do you know what? I'm a, I'm a researcher and I use art as my research tool and I actually generate knowledge-based outputs. So responses on that question of hierarchy and collaboration and so on um, from the panel? Yeah, well, actually, just a comment before about this idea of uh, post-disciplinary. I think the post-disciplinary discourse is happening within the humanities because the humanities are kind of bankrupt at the moment, mm -hmm. and they are moving towards the post-humanities. In the sciences, it's interesting that, especially in the life sciences, they already lost the war. The life sciences already rolled over and succumbed to the engineering mindset. So they're already kind of past that as well. So we just need to be aware of it that this kind of discussion doesn't really happen in the same levels in those disciplines it happens on a different level and I, I'm much more interested in looking at mindset so the engineering mindset versus the scientific mindset versus the artistic mindset and the post-humanity mindset if you like and see how those things are coming together because I think that's where things are, are heading um, to do with the hierarchy I think it's also quite uh, relevant because um, there's this idea that you know once you tell the life scientists that they rolled over to engineers it's easier for you as an artist to move in and they would <laughs> realize that actually you're not as bad as they already kind of experienced <laughs> and, and that's what we've done at Symbiotica it took me many years but Symbiotica is considered to be yet another research lab within a biological science department I'm a head of a research center within and my colleagues are all scientists in the life sciences and we, I had to fight really hard but all of my researchers are as equal to all of the other researchers within the school and that really helps the whole way in which our research takes place. Although what they're doing is artistic research and not scientific one. So it takes, you know, it takes guts, and I think you have to be in a god for second place like Perth for that to start. But, uh, it's, that goes out Perth audience. It, it, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, it, you know, that if, if we as artists wouldn't stand up for what we think is important, we would keep, you know, we'll find ourselves like the life scientists being exploited. Okay. Mm. Well, okay. I think... You as an artist have certainly redefined what art is. 
Is that right? You're not doing what's called derisively called flat art. You're doing you're doing something else, and you're using science. Okay, uh, I'm that, using the tools of science. Yes. Okay, what? Yeah. No science, no art. Right. That's the and and so what you want to call collaboration or whatever you call it. There are scientists around who do uh, uh, contribute. It's obvious, you know, like any other, uh, in, like any other material, it was developed by technologists, by engineers, by scientists. Right. You know, it, it doesn't preclude me as an artist to engage with those tools. No, without I'm necessarily saying, I'm saying that there is a merging together. I mean, like, all, like with all type of human endeavor, there was always a merging together between different mindsets. You know, so. Oh, well, I'm talking about yeah. disciplines. I'm, talking, I'm not talking about mindsets. But of course, that's yeah. yeah. Cat. Oh, well, there's a lot of threads to take up there. Um, I, did, I wanted to respond very briefly to mm-hmm. the lady um, in the back who, who was talking about, you know, not, not going too far with the democratisation and that education needs to unpin, underpin that, and I completely agree. Um, and I think, you know, uh, what I was talking about there was something that's really in a nascent state, you know, um, and training in a discipline, it really, I mean, in, yeah, the, the way that our structures are set up, you know, that's, that's the only way that you currently have to do it. Um, but we have identified that there are institutions where now you can train in both, which is, you know, it's fantastic. It's a, it's a major step. Um, and I think that that is an acceptance that the existing hierarchies really are um, shifting at least you know when it comes to a hierarchy of um, of an elite that's mm. progressing um, away from the many I don't actually think that's true mm. um, there's there's so much outreach now you know it, both in science and in the arts and in the humanity it, Everywhere, there's there's so much intellectual outreach, and it's engaging people in diverse communities. And I think that that kind of, that that's the education that we require to kind of stimulate people to engage. So I I think that the hierarchies are, are moving. Mm-hmm. Okay, thank you. And Anais, I mean, you're you know thinking about this educational. Uh, facility and you know unfortunately there is the pressure in most of the UK education system to choose you know age 13 or whatever it is between specialising in the sciences or the arts Um, you yourself uh, I believe you're from France France and um, you have a a, a scientific background in the family and and so on I mean could you could you maybe draw out some examples Mm -hmm. from that well I mean obviously the the French system educational system is really different because you don't have to choose at an early age so the idea is to continue at 18 or 19 um, to have a broad like understanding and discovery about like, I mean, just having the basis in the sciences and humanities and art. Um, although you still specialize, but it's still having the basis of all this. Um, still, I don't know how much interaction between mm-hmm. the art and sciences are kind of like nurture at that level. Mm-hmm. And in fact, now what I can see more in the university system in front is that more at a PhD level mm. that interaction is really starting to occur mm-hmm. Okay, thank you and, and Robert, do, uh, I believe we might have some uh, um, Twitter I've, I've, I've only just got Wi-Fi connection Right well, that's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> All this talk, all this talk Sorry, of technology I is, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I've only just got it um, Francis, are there any questions that you've picked up on there's lots of comments and lots of tweets, but yeah, I can't see a single question. Questions. Just yet. Okay. Lots of retweeting um, and so on, but and comments. And there's several people in the room who have been making statements but not actually asking questions. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's fair enough. Read us a couple of tweets. A um, couple of tweets. Uh, <laughs> the idea of a post-disciplinary world? Question mark. Academic institutions are stuck in silos as our students aren't. Art and science. Um, Clarity of intention and relationship across the disciplines can help avoid self marginalization of a movement, uh, and so on. 
Okay, we'll come back to that later. I, sorry, yes. So no, these people ask yes. questions out there. Um, well, I'll take the two questions that are being asked, and then I would like, if possible, to move the discussion a little bit onto uh, the market, because I think that that's an important consideration, is, you know, how do we make this... Uh, Pay. Mm. So, um, yes, the, the lady, uh, sorry, the gentleman just in front, yes, because you were, yeah. Uh, could I then uh, put a question to the panel uh, to try and open up the discussion? Uh, it is often considered that science doesn't uh, need any sense of, uh, any aesthetic sense, uh, but art is built around an aesthetic sense. Could they perhaps. Uh, Yes, that isn't true. Science is built around aesthetics. Well, I, I believe that's what oh, you do believe that. I'm sorry, I, uh, I fell for it. Yeah. <laughs> well, science is built around aesthetics. There are beautiful equations, and uh, the definition of, of aesthetics and science, what is aesthetic and science, there is an objective definition for where it was an art, as, is, as art is presently defined, there is not. Uh, it's catch the eye, but in science, an equation is beautiful if it maintains its form when its constituents are changed around. Um, so that's a beautiful equation. There are beautiful experiments that are performed. There is a definition of what a beautiful experiment is, and so on. And so the idea now is to look at <coughs> these notions of aesthetics and beauty and science and see how they stack up next to the, the same notions in art if you're, going to move, if you're going to move the two together. As it turns out that the great scientific discoveries have been made by people who have a sense of aesthetics. Thank you. And um, your, your question, yes? I just wanted to ask whether there's been any comparative studies of art science movements between places where you've got segregation um, pre-university for subjects versus mm -hmm. where people study it for longer, so it's in direct response to... The ladies education in France and whether there is even an art science movement in France because I'm, I don't really know like what art science is like around the world and whether it actually exists okay mm -hmm. yes a, a couple of questions there then you know international examples mm -hmm. um, briefly if you would or any knowledge of comparative studies yeah. well I mean there is quite a stronger art and science movement uh, starting in France maybe started only a, a few years ago but one of the big issues is or, I mean, often the art is instrumentalized. Uh, so, for example, in the south of Paris, there is a, a really important scientific hub with like, uh, laboratories, uh, nuclear laboratories and universities, and um, the, politics, uh, the politicians are trying to set up artistic um, endeavors and collaborations and projects to get the inhabitants around to encounter and discover what is happening in the labs, so it's a bit reductive. <coughs> but I've got another more positive example, which just started last October uh, between the universities uh, in Paris, which link in fact the humanities and the science and the art and its PhD programs. Um, and so in fact the students are you know, yeah, invited to move around and build up from this network uh, their own research. Mm -hmm. OK, thank you. Any, any others? So I have been searching the globe for art science collaborations um, as part of my work at New Scientist, and I found, I found them in most places. I, it's, this is not to say that they don't exist in other places, but um, where I haven't found them has been um, in the continent of Africa, in India, um, and in China, so far as I... Well, no, there, there are some, there's not a, a movement that I can identify, but there are some Chinese artists who are um, doing kind of art science. So elsewhere, there's really quite a strong um, sort of tr thread of art science movements, you know. Um, so, yeah, it's a, as to comparative studies, I'm not aware of any. No, it's a really interesting question. It would be, for, for the practice of kind of interdisciplinarity, it would be a very interesting study to do. So if, if a anyone PhD has or two. It, yeah, yes. absolutely. Yeah. I, I hope okay. somebody does. Yeah. Or right. let me just say, in China there is quite a lot, and actually there's a government directive towards this. Exactly. Yes, I actually got an email asking me to be a guest curator the only request of the government for because there's a government directive in combining art and science, and that was uh, the big art and science uh, uh, exhibition or festival that took place in Beijing last year. Yeah. Yeah. So, 
It happens. It also happens in Tsinghua University. There's the Art and Science Media Lab there that uh, was developed a few years ago. Uh, in India, there's things like the Srishti School of Art and Design and the work that they're doing with uh, the Central, uh, what, the National Center of Biological Sciences in Bangalore. And also in New Delhi, there's a couple of uh, initiatives. So there's quite a lot of stuff happening also in those places. Did you find anywhere in Africa? In <coughs> Africa. No. Actually, in yeah. South Africa, there might be some yeah. bits, but yeah, not in the rest. So, yeah. Not that I know about. I think it's just true to say that like five years ago, I think I could have put together a document that would have said, okay, these are the different locations and movements and so on. But if I tried to do it now, I think it'd be a full time job because it's constantly expanding at such a rapid rate. And I've lost count of how many emails I've had in the last. You know, seven, eight months from different institutions, educational institutions from around the world saying, you know, what's happening in London, we hear about this, we hear about that, and different, you know, universities saying, you know, this is what we're planning to do, and can you put us in touch with, you know, this person or that person, and, you know, um, the, the Centre St. Martin's uh, MA in Art and Sciences and students here from that as well, Nathan Cohen, who's leading that, he gets a lot of inquiries as well from different people. So the, the interest is, 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 you know, kind of increasing at a, a very rapid rate that I kind of have lost kind of the feelers that I used to have out there and I used to think that I kind of had a good idea about what was happening but it's just it's just it's growing too fast for me to even try and keep you know try and keep a track of what's going. And, and Arthur you were doing it before it was fashionable so I mean, yes, <laughs> right, yeah. yeah I mean uh, yeah I had a similar conversation with Ken Arnold at the welcome some years ago that uh, we knew of all art science conferences going on around the world now it's now there are literally thousands of them there their lesion <laughs> um, most of them are pretty bad, but they are, they do exist. In the U.S., art science is extremely strong. Uh, it's taught at the School of Visual Arts, for example, and all, all across the country. Yeah, okay. Well, thank you. I saw a hand waving in this direction. Am I? Um, okay, well, if, if not, um, I, I would pose a question, perhaps uh, to the panel and the audience, is that how do we, you know, what is the market uh, for this? I was certainly very struck, um, and, and, and should we be worried about a market? Should we keep it within the cultural sector, you know, charity stroke research funding, um, you know, broadly within the educational uh, ambit, um, or you know, should we be going out to make um, make a, a you know a big market for this? Is there already one? I was certainly quite struck. You know, between the different kinds of audiences that you might get, perhaps at, at, at this gallery, with you know, for hence the contrast that you might get uh, with some that exist elsewhere, um, and you know, in terms of the you know the big art fairs and things like that, and clearly there was you know an awful lot of money going around at um, the recent Art Thirteen fair sponsored by Citibank and things. You know, so you know, there is a, a material difference. It strikes me, but I'm just wondering how you know whether where we should be going in terms of those kind of of, um, uh, realities. I think right at the beginning you you used the phrase can we make it pay? Uh, you're now getting back to this subject I think. Um, I'm going to sort of um, use a slightly different phrase. I'm going to talk about wealth generation. It sounds a bit better in a way. Um, and this will only be important when that really happens. And I think I was the one who mentioned about this 2%. Now, a definition of whether a, um, a creative partnership between a scientist and an artist has been successful is, has it generated wealth? That's what it's all about. Um, and it doesn't matter from which side. In fact, you can't define which side that happens. Um, I don't think I'm going to try and give you examples now because I've mentioned they're few and far between, but they do exist. And um, I know that in the not too distant past, I was quite convinced that with a number of my colleagues with, that we in this country were leading the way in this new endeavour of bringing the scientists and artists together in order to create wealth. Um, and we compared it to the days of the Industrial Revolution, just as we were the first in to that um, new discovery. We were the first into this post-industrial society. It hasn't happened. I'm very interested to discuss further why it hasn't happened. Um, I think it's partly because the various initiatives that are uh, um, started 
with great endeavour and great enthusiasm to make this happen are all on the cultural side and not on the commercial side. And secondly, and I have approached so many people in government about this, I don't even want to think about it, it is because there is nobody there all these think tanks, all these various departments, there is nobody who believes it. And you've got to have people there with the money who believe it. Um, and I still don't think those people exist. We believe it in this room, but we have not convinced the people who really need to be convinced. <clears throat> Uh, well, yes, that, that's a, in, a very interesting provocation and one that certainly would accord you know, with certain observations um, uh, that I've made, that there's a lot of lip service and, and not exactly. that much policy. Yeah. Um, but uh, there may be different experiences. I presume by we you meant in the UK um, uh, or you as a, yes, a I, group and a pioneer. Quite that's quite that's insular, right, <laughs> OK. <laughs> well, you don't, you don't need collaboration for sellability. Um, the, the, what the main... I mean, I know lots of artists who sell, who are in media art and sell their art to, yes. uh, to get, wait, 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 the, the, the main, there's, there's a, there's a, there's a stop, stop gap here. It's, <laughs> it's the art world, big A, big W. Uh, they're run by curators who uh, brought up in a traditional art history education. They know nothing about technology or science, and it scares them. They just stay away from it. And it also, there's other problems involved that technological art can break down and it's not unique and so on and so forth. So it is very rare that you see anything decent in any art world gallery. But as, as I mentioned, there are other niches now. There are people out, artists I've interviewed who said, the hell with them. We have our own places. I said that. Yeah, we have uh, I said, you know, yeah. the, the, yeah. the places I mentioned that, that, yeah. do, that do sell. Yeah. And they also sell privately um, as well. Um, about that will be discussed by a book in great place, but that's that's essentially it. Uh, artists now say the hell with them in various other comments. Uh, we have our own places, and eventually there are people coming into curating now in their twenties who do have a. Artists now have a technological education too. They just grow up with computers and so on, and these people by the time they're forty will be big time curators. The rest will die off, and things will things will change. I mean, in, in the Tate Modern, there has never been an art science exhibition. There's only one piece of media art that has ever been there, and that's, uh, it's called The Exquisite Forest. It's worthwhile seeing. It's done by Aaron Koblen, mm. who's the uh, 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 creative director at Google. <coughs> Otherwise, that's it. Well, the Tate Modern now does have tanks, and that is a move in the right direction. Well, it's a move in the right direction. But, sure, but it's, nothing like, it's nothing like the MoMA, for example. And even that, they don't have art science, they have media art. But then again, MoMA have got a print of this, and where do you think they put it? In the, the permanent collection. In, in, the, in the architecture design department. Design design. Oh, right. Because they didn't know where to put it. Yeah. I mean, you yeah, know, yeah, where yeah. to buy art. Well, that's very interesting. And Aaron, you put that there, what, 10 years ago? No, no, actually, it was 2000. You made it 2000. Yeah, I made it in 2000. So, I mean, this is what we're up against. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, the, and there is a slow growing market, and, and believe me, it's really slow, <laughs> and we really struggle. But what cheers me up is that majority of our sales that we have in this gallery, and we don't have enough of them yet, but it's predominantly scientists. More than half of our sales are scientists who I think wouldn't otherwise be buying art or spending as much on art if they didn't connect or relate to it. So that cheers me up. It's not enough, but I think that's you know encouraging. That's why I see more and more of. But as far as the big A and the big W, I mean, you know... They don't know. Um, but then again, you know, you can talk about other people like Mark Quinn. I mean, I would call him an art science artist, but he refuses to have that label. What he does is very much, I mean, he still works with scientists, he has got a scientific training background, etc. but he doesn't want to be boxed into that because otherwise, you know, he may not have had the profile that he has now had he pursued what some of us, you know, would like to, to support and promote. Mm. The whole notion of labels is really interesting because in this particular world we have a label, art science. There are loads of artists that work, for example, with political issues, but we don't have a category art politics, mm -hmm. that whole category of artists sitting as a niche. So there's something about science that defines the whole way of defining quite differently. It's sexier than politics. Mm. <laughs> Take Mark Wallinger, who does both, you know, for instance. But um, question over there. 
Yeah, I was just, it was a point that um, the onus seems to always be on the artist having to be in a market and rather than the scientist having to be in a market. And, um, you know, why aren't we looking at what, where they're selling <coughs> their work and what they have to produce? Because that's a relevant point as well. Um, and the fact that there are artists, um, I've had this discussion with Lauren, and, and I'm one who, I don't think I've actually sold work for years, but I... I earn my money through my research like I said but also where my research is, is, is put out and I think it's the knowledge it's, it's the knowledge market that is one that needs to be really tapped into and, and we shouldn't uh, we shouldn't overlook that because it may not be as obvious a market to some people in the room as it actually is. Well, I don't, I don't get that point. But what I, what I will say is that that, that, is a difference, that is a big difference between art and science in that uh, the scientists can get a, a, a tenured position and just sit there forever and, and publish. That's fine and good. Um, artists have to sell their work. But a lot of artists now are, are belonging to faculties. Art faculties and, and arts, art, science, whatever you want to call them, media artists, whatever, uh, they belong to art faculties and they do make a living. And they will emphasize that they have an advantage over artists who are self employed, that they can take their time with their work and they can use also the workshops um, in the places where they are, like the School for Visual Arts or the Royal College of Art, which are formidable institutions. But there are artists in the room here that don't work in art faculties, that work in... Well, I said that's a big difference between art and science. Yeah, there, there are people... There are no... Uh, uh, there are scientists who are self-employed. They're called consultants, and they do sell their work. Okay, all right. Um, yeah, just um, in the risk of uh, provoking even more and making you uh, even more annoyed with me, uh, <laughs> <laughs> one, one point is that uh, before 2000, before we were able to show our live teacher engineered sculptures in uh, cultural settings, we actually had a couple of sold out shows, and we sold our work mainly to doctors for kind of the uh, waiting rooms and whatever. And I'm so happy that I didn't go down this path because my life is so much more interesting now than if I would just keep on pumping those beautifully, you know, those. Aesthetic prints and then to become a slave to, to, to doctor waiting rooms. Uh, but <laughs> but uh, going back to the point about wealth uh, construction, I think I think the health of a, of a society and a culture is measured by uh, the amount and the kind of frivolous activity that the society chooses to engage with. And we need to convince politicians that this is what's important. And I find it quite striking that, especially here in the UK, where you have the royal family. You still need to convince politicians that frivolity is good, <laughs> <laughs> and I think the type of frivolity that this type of engagement uh, provides to the culture is much healthier than the royal oh, family. Mm -hmm. If only, <laughs> if only we had a royal family that could do it for us. <laughs> we don't. Prince of Wales used to be like that, no longer. <laughs> Two questions. Uh, which one's back? We've got some Twitter questions as well. We have. Francis. Splendid. Okay, oh, Francis. Well, we'll take the Twitter questions first, and then if we have the time, uh, we'll come back. So, um, so a question from Lucy Lyons, um, who says, at the end of the day, uh, we all generate stuff. Do we need to be labelled in specific disciplines to do so? Um, so, and then, have we already answered that? Yeah, I think so. so yeah, extent. we have. Yes. And then this is just another statement from Megan Dowie, who's a neuroscientist based in Oxford, saying artists, artists and scientists work together. It's not often true collaboration. What shall we call it instead? Hmm. So, I don't think we're get, going to get the answer in the next ten minutes. No, uh, perhaps not. But and on the on the pursuit of meaningful co collaboration in art and science from um, Heather Barnett, uh, can one engage meaningfully with an other discipline? Um, if they don't have one. I think that's a, a valid sort of uh, question, which kind of relates to that earlier discussion we had about, you know, the, the becoming post-disciplinary, or do you actually need that training to kind of, you know, give you the, uh, the mental robustness um, to, in, in order to engage in anything meaningful? I don't think you have to survive within a particular silo to to be able to engage with somebody who feels that they do exist within a particular silo. I think you just have to have a, a solid grounding um, in, and an ability to communicate effectively with the person with whom you're interacting. You know, if you bring something of value to the table in the exchange, then that's enough, I think. Mm -hmm. 
I, I was thinking um, it brings to mind uh, I've just been researching brain uh, surgery in Manchester and uh, Sir Geoffrey Jefferson you know, was placed he was a, a leading neurosurgeon at the time in the 1930s and uh, you know placed his ability in that to, uh, on his ability his, his, his knowledge of classical literature and so on you know there's, there's a connection the kind of structured and logical thinking and so on so yes I think uh, you know I'm, I shouldn't be contributing in this respect but I do think that I can see that how that point might be the case any other thoughts on that particular relationship I think but it's how the public or how the, the our, our market in a sense reads what we do mm. so if we don't have a discipline it won't be able to be read mm. in a sense mm. there's no dictionary to, to read from mm. or to, to be able to kind of to, to understand what language one is using if we don't come from a specific point of view mm. and so yeah, that's why right. labels are important yeah. yeah okay two more questions there was one one back there and then uh, another and I think then we should be winding up the discussion uh, I guess I was just going to agree with Oren basically that the kind of that you call them frivolous, but they're not really frivolous. But stuff that doesn't necessarily generate wealth, but generate intellectual wealth or knowledge and learning is what we should really be focusing on. Like also, what the lady over there said about like the research element of it is what's really important. That artists, uh, some you know, artists and scientists, when they collaborate, they're they're learning something from one another um, and the thinking of wealth production in terms of national wealth production is very unhelpful I think because what we can do is collaborate across you know, international collaboration is obviously going to be an exciting thing Thank you, yes When you talk me about sustainability and one of the key issues across all life issues, so political, social, is ecology and the environment. So I think that's possibly going to be another big sector where it will cross over. I don't know what channel thinks. Mm. It's again it's not the most fashionable sector of, of, of fine art to necessarily be in, but it, I think it will probably grow in importance. But it has to grow in importance. Any thoughts on the response? Uh, for me again, I'm sorry. Yes. Yeah, expecting artists to solve environmental problems is uh, the wrong way to try and solve it. Yeah? So, um, and that's, I think, one of the issues that I've seen in Australia in particular. There's now funding towards this type of approach, mm -hmm. hoping that artists would somehow have a, a kind of a magic bullet that would solve those problems. So, no, I think artists can problematize the issues further. Artists can raise some of those questions up and surface uh, some of the other issues that are concerning the way we humans uh, engage with the rest of the world, but uh, it's not about using art to solve those issues. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. A statement from Catherine Dowson, um, uh, who's one of our gallery artists. She said that she was blowing glass stomachs and science work in 1989 and sold work to Saatchi in 1992. So why has it taken it so long for people to wake up to the work? Mm -hmm. I think that would be a good, uh, uh, perhaps, moment to draw this to a close. Um, and uh, I would like, of course, to thank our, our host, Robert Deb Church of GV Art in London, and uh, also to our panellists, uh, Professor Arthur Miller, Anais uh, Tondeur, Kat Ost, Dr. Kat Austin, and uh, Oren Katz. And uh, from me, uh, Marius Quint, and uh, from all the, uh, also the audience assembled here with them, many distinguished um, uh, administrators, researchers, practitioners, interested uh, public uh, and artists amongst us, thank you very much. And uh, I think we've had a, and please do, oh yes, the uh, important thing is please do stay for a drink. Um, hospitality is one of the um, one of the aspects of uh, modern curatorship, I gather, and one that we, would, uh, we will all enjoy. So thank you. Thank you.